Hello everyone and welcome back to the wonderful world of chemistry. Today we are looking at a concept that in GCSE it throws a lot of people. Um, I don't even remember doing it when I did it at GCSE, um, but it definitely came up at A level and then again at degree level. The concept is reversible reactions with the Le Chatelier principle. D'accord, Le Chatelier, Monsieur Le Chatelier. Uh, you know, I may love a bit of French. Um, so what we're going to focus on today is re-establishing the basics of GCSE. Um, I'm going to assume you've forgotten it from GCSE just because it's easier to start with a blank slate than it would be to kind of figure out what you already know and address it that way. Um, everyone's knowledge and confidence with this is going to be at very, very different levels. So if you are finding this really easy, great. Good for you. Um, there's some extension work on Edmodo. Go go do that in the meantime. Uh, everyone else, stay here. Let's figure this out together. Okay, so for a reversible reaction, there is lots of really unusual language that we tend to use with it. The examples of which are shown on the board here. So a closed system, dynamic and equilibrium. Does anyone know what those words actually mean? Or can you potentially give an example? Okay, in any chemical reaction, you can have a closed system or an open system. A little analogy used uh, in lesson to explain this is the example of a fizzy drinks bottle. Uh, I've gone for Coke there. It doesn't necessarily have to be Coca-Cola. It can be any drinks. Other brands are available. Um, so on the left hand side of your screen, there is an open bottle. Now with this open bottle, obviously the gases can escape. Okay. So in an open system, chemicals, specifically gases, can escape very easily. In a closed system, the reaction is happening where no reactants or products can escape at all. So within a fizzy drink, we actually have got a reversible reaction happening. So this here, you can see uh, carbon dioxide plus water is reacting together to form the hydrogen carbonate there. But then the hydrogen carbonate will decompose to give off carbon dioxide and water, okay? And when this is happening in a closed system, there is no, uh, we'd call it no net change, no overall change of the concentrations that are present there. It remains constant. However, when the bottle has opened, some of the carbon dioxide, so that's a reactant there that would be present as a gas, that gas will escape. Therefore, that will affect what we call the position of the equilibrium. We'll talk about that in more detail in a second. Okay, but with a fizzy drink, you know that the more you open it, the more bubbles escape. So the last little bit, if you're drinking over a period of time, the last little bit of your drink, all the fizz has gone because what the fizz is, is just carbon dioxide. Okay, so an open system is open, things can escape. A closed system, nothing can escape. For an equilibrium to be established, you must have a closed system. Okay, dynamic equilibrium. I'm going to mix those two words together there. Equilibrium is essentially just a balance, okay? So linking this to biology, in your ear you have your cochlea. Your cochlea is full of like uh, some sort of fluid. Let's call it cochleal juice. Juice, yes. Meh. Yeah whatever it's called. I should probably ask Mr. Bates in that. Um, but that's kind of like a spirit level inside your head. So when you tilt, that moves. Okay, that defines your equilibrium as in your sense of balance in yourself. So if you go like that, you know you've gone like that. Um, there is actually a medical condition where people have got, uh, like it misreads it, so they can't tell if they're upright or not. Um, true story, one of my lecturers at university, he had a friend who had it who would just go, and just fall over and just had to sit there for a little while uh, until his equilibrium re-established and he could get back up again. Bad times. Anyway, back to what we're actually supposed to be talking about. Little story time there. Uh, so, 
So an equilibrium is a balance between the reactants and the products in this example. Now we call it a dynamic equilibrium when the forward reaction, i.e. that way, and the backward reaction, that way, are happening at the same time and at the same rate. There is one word that we use to express that together that is called simultaneously. So if you say the reactions are happening simultaneously, that does imply the same time and the same rate. However, sometimes on the exams they are a bit fussy about that. So it is best to separate it into same time and same rate. Uh, so I've said here in dynamic equilibrium, the forward and backwards reaction happen at the same time and rate. So the amounts I hate that word, you know I hate that word, um, but I've left it as amounts because it could be volume, concentration, it does vary depending on what we're talking about, so the amounts of each don't change. The symbol for dynamic equilibrium and equilibrium just in general is this, so it's a, a two half arrows like that. Uh, and we can express the forward reaction just with a single arrow going that way and the backwards reaction with a single arrow going that way. Just realised with the camera that's probably inverted the way that I've tilted. Never mind. A little silly way to think about this is uh, someone trying to get up an escalator really, really quickly. So if you try and sprint up an escalator, you might make it if your speed is fast enough. However, in this example here, this person is running up the escalator at the same rate which the escalator is going downwards. So if no other factor changes, there is going to be no net movement, no final movement overall, because the rate going down is the same as the rate going up. OK, that's just another silly way of thinking about it to help you kind of visualise what's going on there. So this is a dynamic equilibrium where the reverse reaction and the forward reaction are happening at the same time, at the same rate. In this analogy, it's the same speed for each one. If we were to try to represent this graphically, this might be what it would look like. So we start with uh, reactants and a product, so high concentration of reactants here. Down here, the product's concentration is zero because the reaction hasn't started yet. The, uh, this is for ammonium chloride decomposing to make ammonia and hydrogen chloride. So that starts decomposing, so therefore the concentration of the products starts increasing. Okay, that keeps going down and down and down. This one keeps going, going up and up and up. And this point here where those two lines, well, three lines, actually intersect, that is the point at which the, that the equilibrium has been established. So that just there is the point where the dynamic equilibrium has been established. At that point, assuming that there is no further uh, external contributing factors, assuming it remains in a closed system, that concentration is going to remain constant because the ammonium chloride is decomposing at the same rate as the and the same time, at the same rate and same time as the ammonia and the hydrogen chloride is reacting together. So the concentrations remain constant. Now something you do have to be careful with there is the idea of the concentrations being constant but not necessarily equal. Um, so this here, I mean this is just a silly example, it's not a chemical change that's happening, it's a physical change because it's going between being a liquid and a gas, so that's a physical change. Uh, so what we might actually have here, despite the fact the concentrations remain constant, they are not necessarily the same. So for example, at equilibrium, we might have 0 0.5, let's go moles per decimeter cubed of the bromine liquid, but actually the concentration of the bromine gas might be two moles. per decimeter cubed, okay? So just a very minor fine point there that just because the concentrations remain constant, so they'll be constantly at that level, the 0 0.5 and the two mole, um, doesn't mean that the concentrations are exactly the same, okay? Because one's 0 0.5 and one's two. They are not the same number, 
but they will remain at that constant level until something affects the position of the equilibrium by, let's say, opening the closed system or changing the heat or the pressure or something like that. OK, position of equilibrium. The position of equilibrium in a reaction, it can lie to the left or to the right. Now, that either means to the left hand side where the reactants are or to the right hand side where the products are. Now, one thing that does confuse a lot of students is when we're talking about this, um, they do tend to think of the forward reaction and the backward reaction happening separately, maybe in like two separate containers, but they're not. Everything is happening all at the same time in the same block of space. OK, now when we say the equilibrium can lie to the left or to the right, that just means it's going to favor either the products or the reaction reactants all in that one set space. OK, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, the Le Chatelier's principle, which sounds strange saying the Le, Le Chatelier's principle, because that's the the Chatelier's principle, but hey ho, it's fine. Uh, so Le Chatelier's principle states, um, there's a very lardy da way of putting it about counteracting and blah, 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 blah. Um, I mean, th this on the screen here is the official one. If the dynamic equilibrium is disturbed by changing the conditions, the position of the equilibrium moves to counteract that change. That is a very la di -da way of saying um, whatever you do to the chemicals, uh, which we call it the system. So when the chemicals are all sort of there in that big box or whatever it may be, that's called the system. Whatever change you do to the system, it will do the opposite. And it does the opposite to try and get back to that equilibrium position. So where it was perfectly balanced in the middle. But what industrial chemists want to do is deliberately manipulate those conditions to suit whatever they need to get out. So if they want to get a specific product, they don't want the reversible reaction happening. They don't want to have to keep they don't want the reactants to be reforming. They just want the product. So they have to ensure that that equilibrium is shifted all the way to the right hand side towards the products. This is my right. So there are three main things that affect the position of equilibrium. What we're going to do is look at each one of them in turn. The three factors are pressure, which only affects gases. OK, so if you've got gaseous reactants and products, pressure will be a factor. If you've got solids and liquids, it won't be a factor there. The concentration of the reactants and the products will definitely affect the position of the equilibrium and so will the temperature. Now, the temperature one is a little bit trickier because we do have to bear in mind that there are exothermic processes and endothermic processes. So that's going to take a little bit more of a detailed explanation to help us understand that. OK, it is extremely common for these to come up as exam questions. And in an exam question, we do know that the examiners are usually looking for specific points to be covered. So over the years, I've come up with this answer format that covers pretty much all the points that the examiners ask for. And actually, in a lot of cases, you don't necessarily have to cover all of these points. You just have to cover maybe two or three of them to get full marks. But I'd like to get you in the habit of answering all of these to make sure that you've covered all the points required. So if you are given a chemical equation and they say state what happens to the position of equilibrium when we increase the concentration of reactant X or whatever the case may be. This is the answer format that I would like you to follow. So start with if I. If I and then you state the factor that is being changed. So if I increase the concentration of chemical X, then the second point is which way does the equilibrium shift to? Does it shift to the left hand side or to the right hand side? The third point here is for you to justify why it goes to that side. So it says the side and depending on which factor we're talking about, concentration, pressure or temperature, there are a few different things that we could say at this point. So for now, I'm just going to leave that as to the side with the and then we'll talk about how that works properly in a few moments. 
fourth bullet point there says to make more. Now, this is one we do have to be careful with. So in some questions, they do want you to specify what happens with respect to a certain uh, reactant. So there's one a few years ago I saw there. It says uh, explain what happens in terms of the amount of carbon monoxide. And what a lot of people were doing is saying, oh, this would make more products. And they were right that it would make more products, but they didn't get the mark because they didn't specify what happened specifically to the concentration or the amount of the carbon monoxide. So to make more, usually you can just get away with saying reactants and products. However, there have been some equate some occasions where you have to specify one chemical in particular. So be careful for that. Read the questions carefully. And then the last point that you always have to make the Le Chatelier's principle is this is all happening to oppose the change I made or that was made to the system. OK, whatever is done to the chemicals, they're going to try to reverse it. They're going to do the opposite. OK, so that answer format, I would strongly advise uh, if you're going to be working through these next ones uh, while this video is on, take a screenshot of that, save that somewhere um, or pause the video now to make a quick note of it. OK, so with gases, what we need to do when we're talking about pressure and gases at equilibrium, we need to always link it back to the number of particles present. So if you increase the pressure in a reaction, the system, the chemicals, are going to try to decrease the pressure. If you decrease the pressure, they're going to try to increase the pressure. OK? Now, once again, I do just want to stress this reaction here, This because it's at dynamic equilibrium, this is happening in the same reaction vessel at the same time at the same rate. If we are increasing the pressure, that's going to increase the pressure of the whole lot. OK, not just necessarily of one side or the other. OK, here's an example. What I will do in this case is work through it with you. And then I'll give you another one to work through by yourself. So I've got uh, two lots of this sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen, O2, to make uh, two lots of sulfur trioxide, I suppose that would be called. OK, so what we need to do is add up the number of particles on the left hand side. So there's two. There's two lots of the sulfur dioxide, one lot of the oxygen. So you can actually see here there are three particles there all together or molecules. On the right hand side, there is just a two there. And you can see on the little diagram that we've sketched there that there's two molecules present. So the high pressure side is going to be the side where there is the most number of of particles. OK, so what I do with these types of equation is I get the equation itself and I end up just scribbling all over it because that somehow works for my brain. So the left hand side here. So the left hand side here has got more particles. So it has also got the high pressure. Whereas on the right hand side, there's only two particles. That's going to be lower pressure. Just think of it when you're in a, a lift, an elevator, uh, the more of you that there are squeezed together in one space, it's like mm, high pressure. Whereas if you like less people there, it's like can stretch out a little bit. Um, don't suppose that analogy works anymore with COVID, but hey ho. <laughs> yeah, when I'm in a supermarket and there's lots of people, my anxiety is high. Uh, when I'm in a supermarket and there's not lots of people, my anxiety is low. There we go. Anxiety, pressure. Hey ho. New analogy there. Uh, so what is going to happen if I increase the pressure in the system? So there we go. Uh, on the left hand side of the screen there, I've still got the PowerPoint with the high and low bit labelled. On the right hand side of your screen, I've got my little notepad. So let's try and answer this question using the answer format. So it started with if I. So if I and we're going to have to put the factor there. The factor that we're changing in this case is pressure. So if I increase the pressure, 
the equilibrium is going to shift, right? So here, we're increasing the pressure. We're trying to make the pressure higher, okay? So if we're going to try to make the pressure higher, the chemicals are going to try to make it lower. So the equilibrium is going to shift to whichever side is the lower pressure. So on this one, if I increase the pressure, it's going to try to decrease the pressure. It's going to go to the low side. So it's going to make more of this stuff that's on the low side to decrease the pressure in the system because there's less particles there. Like the security coming and kicking loads of people out of Morrison's to make me less stressed. Um, so the equilibrium is going to shift to the right hand side. I'm just going RHS for now, not Royal Horticultural Society. It stands for right hand side. Equally, you could just put to the right. That'd be fine too. The third point is to the side with, and we have to justify this for pressure in terms of the number of particles present, to the side with less particles. And you might even want to sort of add an. You might even want to add an extra layer of justification there if you want to the side with less particles, i.e., lower pressure, or therefore the low pressure side. To make more, um, now it's not specified here uh, any specific reactant or product that we have to talk about it in respect to. So uh, let's just go to make more and it's going to make more of the SO3. So to make more SO3, that'll do it. Or to make more products, that'd be fine. And the last point, to oppose the change made to the system. And that is, that is it. If that was a five marker, that's one, two, three, four, five marks achieved. Job done. Okay. Have a go at the next one by yourselves. Feel free to pause the video now if you need to. Here we go then. You've had a bit of time to have a look at that. Let's pop in the answers into the answer format and see what works. So if I decrease the pressure, so okay, our first bit of the sentence in the answer format was always going to be if I do something to the factor. So let's go if I decrease the pressure, the equilibrium is going to shift. So you're trying to make the pressure lower. So the chemicals are going to do the exact opposite and try to make the pressure higher. Which is the high pressure side? It's this one because there's more particles present, more molecules present. So it's going to shift in this case to the left hand side, LHS, or just put left. I think let's just put left. It's easier, isn't it? To the side with more particles, i.e., higher pressure to make more reactants or you could specify a uh, sulfur dioxide and oxygen okay relatively straightforward i like to think here's some questions for you to have a go at you are very welcome to write a full answer or the answers that I'm going to show here are just the shortened version. So whether it goes to the left hand side or to the right hand side. So have a go at those questions now. For question one, on the left hand side, there is only one molecule particle present. On this one, there are two on the right hand side. So this is is the high pressure side and this is the low pressure side if we are increasing the pressure for all of these uh, it's going to go to the lower number each time so that's going to force it to the left equilibrium shifts to the left in number two 
we have got one there, two there. So we've got three on the left hand side uh, and there's no sort of prefix. Would we use that um, word? No, it's not. It's a uh, co coefficient. Aha, I has maths. Uh, so there's one particle molecule on the right hand side there. There's three on the left hand side there. If we're increasing the pressure, it's going to go to the lowest number. So there we go. That's the lowest number there. Low pressure side. Um, so it's going to shift it to the right. Equilibrium shifts to the right. Number three, uh, hopefully lots of you have realized already, it is a trick question. So there's one there, one there. So that's two on the left hand side. There's two on the right hand side there. Each side of the equation have therefore an equal number of particles and therefore an equal pressure. So um, in this example, there is no change in equilibrium there according to pressure. Okay, so that is how pressure affects position of equilibrium. How concentration affects position of the equilibrium, I think is the most logical out of all of them. Basically, if there's more particles present, then that reaction is going to happen more. That just makes sense in terms of the stuff that we've talked about um, with rate of reaction. So in this example here, if I increase the concentration of the sulfur trioxide, so this thing here, there's going to be more of that to thermally decompose. There's more of that to decompose. So yeah, it's going to force it to the left hand side. That just kind of makes sense. OK, so let's use the answer format again. So if I increase the concentration so I'm just going to go conk for short because I'm feeling lazy, uh, of the SO3. The equilibrium is going to shift to the left. I.e. to the side with or to the side with a relatively lower concentration. That one doesn't really apply very well to this one. So that might be one that we don't necessarily have to include for this one. But to make more, and again, you can specify the, the, the sulfur dioxide and the oxygen, or you could just say to make more reactants. Um, that is one thing people get a bit hung up with, um, like, because technically the reactants... These are the reactants for the forward reaction, but these are the reactants for the backwards reaction. Um, we just treat it like reading from left to right okay so those are the reactants those are the products still that's how we can just justify it and um, if you really want to justify it in a lardy dar way you could say with respect to the forward reaction or with respect to the backwards reaction and i've not seen them catch anyone out on that on the exams um doesn't mean they're never going to bother though uh, so if i increase the concentration of the sulfur trioxide the equilibrium is going to shift to the left to the side with a lower concentration um or you could say because there's more SO3 reacting or decomposing. Just got gone decomping there because I've run out of space there. Uh, to make more reactants to oppose the change I made to the system. That'll do it. Uh, so here's one I made earlier. Um, the position of the equilibrium shifts to the left. Some of the newly added uh, sulfur trioxide decomposes until the equilibrium is re-established. The reverse reaction, so the backwards reaction, uh, speeds up temporarily. 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 Tempor the reverse reaction speeds up for a short period of time. Temporarily. Can't say that word. Okay, here's another question. Go for it. Okay, are we ready to go? If I decrease the concentration of the sulfur trioxide, okay, let's pop that into my answer format. If I decrease the concentration there, the equilibrium, okay, so there's less of this stuff. So if we took if we think about it in terms of rate of reaction, that means there's less of that stuff getting in the way 
of the things on the left hand side of the reactants there. So we have lowered the concentration of the sulfur trioxide, therefore there's more likely to be collisions between the sulfur dioxide and the oxygen there. So we can link this to rate of reaction but you do have to be a little bit careful sometimes not to confuse rate and equilibrium position. Okay, So there's going to be more relatively speaking, more space for these to react, there's going to be more collisions between those on the left hand side, therefore the equilibrium, therefore they're going to be reacting more and replacing that that was decreased. So that's going to be reacting faster, so it's going to be making more of that. So the equilibrium is going to shift to the right basically to replace the stuff that you got rid of to the side in fact let's change that to replace the lost the removed sulfur trioxide. Again within that you can say uh, because the reactants are more, oh my days my handwriting's getting bad isn't it, sorry, more likely to collide. So forward reaction is occurring faster. That says forward reaction increases. I'm so sorry, that looks awful, doesn't it? Uh, to make more product, i.e. the SO3, to oppose the change I made to the system. Okay? Okay, so that is the first two factors and how they affect the position of equilibrium. In our next video, what we're going to be talking about is how temperature affects the position of equilibrium, both in terms of just raw, hot and cold, but also in terms of whether it is an exothermic or an endothermic reaction. Until next time, bye bye.